Hello everybody. Uh, today what we're going to be doing is giving you a rough introduction to moral reasoning and moral thinking. Discuss a little bit about the principles we'll be appealing to throughout the semester in order to talk about issues in bioethics. So first we should just get into what we're doing when we're thinking about morality. So when we're thinking about morality, there are some defining characteristics of that thinking. And those characteristics are listed here for you. Uh, universality, normative dominance, impartiality, and reasonableness. We'll go through each of these in turn. Uh, universality is um, probably something you already have in mind when you're thinking about morality. So when we're talking about universality, what we mean is that moral norms apply universally. In other words, they apply to everyone who's in a rel relevantly similar circumstance. And so it's not uh, the case that moral norms apply to uh, your friends, but they don't apply to you, or they apply to people in the United States, but they don't apply to people in Russia so on and so forth, right? If there is a moral principle that tells us how to act in a particular circumstance, that applies to everybody who's in that same circumstance or a circumstance that is similar in the relevant ways. And so let's look at an example here. So when you lend a friend money, Right? You believe that they are obligated to pay you back, right? That's why you're lending. It comes with a promise they'll pay it back. Uh, so you think there's a moral norm that applies. Your friend has a moral obligation to pay back the money that they borrowed. Now we flip it, right? A friend loans you money and comes time to pay your friend back and you don't really feel like it and you don't think you're obligated. Right? But there's nothing different about your situation. It's not like you're going to starve if you give uh, the $20 back to your friend. Right? So you're both in relevantly similar circumstances. So the same moral principle would apply to both of you. You're both obligated to repay the loan. Now, what could be uh, something that changes the situation here? Right? So we're saying that it only applies to people who are in relevantly similar circumstances. So let's go back to the lending money example. How could your situation change where you wouldn't have to pay your friend back that money, right? You're not morally obligated to pay your friend back. That could happen if, like I said uh, a second ago, giving the $20 back to your friend would mean you don't make your rent that month and you're kicked out of your house uh, or you wouldn't be able to eat and you'd starve so on and so forth, right? Those are morally relevant parts of the scenario. Um, so those can change the situation. But if you and your friend are in those same sets of circumstances, right? You're not starving. You won't be kicked out of your house. Then you both have the obligation to pay uh, the loan back. And that would apply universally, not just you and your friend, but to everybody in the entire world. Uh, and then here I also say, when we make excuses for our actions, what we're often trying to do is just say, look, I know there is a moral norm that applies, uh, but my circumstances are different. Right? There's something about the situation I'm in, which means that principle doesn't apply to me. Some other principle applies to me. But notice here, when we're making these excuses for our actions, um, what we're doing is saying, look, I, I believe there are universal moral principles and I know they apply uh, in certain circumstances and I just don't happen to be in that circumstance right now. So when we're making excuses, it seems like we're also just assuming that there is some moral norm uh, and we need to explain why we're in different circumstances. Okay, that's universality. So now let's move on to normative dominance. This one's pretty easy. Uh, this is a common thought about morality as well. There are a number of norms that we can think about in the world. Right? There are practical norms. In other words, what should you do if you need to achieve some goal? What's the best route there? Um, so if you want to get an A in a class, uh, a good practical norm is that you need to study. So if you want to get an A in a class, then you should study. Uh, so that's a practical norm. We also have aesthetic norms, 
etiquette norms, legal norms, right? So in terms of uh, United States etiquette norms, uh, it's considered rude to not keep eye contact with somebody while you're talking. Uh, we have uh, generally cultural norms for saying hi to people or holding open doors for strangers, so on and so forth, right? So there are some norms like that. Uh, aesthetic norms, we have some cultural norms about what is aesthetically pleasing, what's beautiful and what's ugly, so on and so forth, right? So there are all these different types of norms that are out there in the world. Uh, but moral norms have normative dominance. In other words, we think that they dominate all of those other types of norms I was just mentioning. All right, so if there's ever uh, some competition right, between the two types of norms, a moral norm and something else, some other type of norm, the moral norm is often considered the more important of the two. Right, so, uh, and this just seems powerfully intuitive, right? So if some practical norm is out there. Uh, but the practical norm tells you that you have to do something immoral in order to achieve your goal. We say, well, the practical norm goes out the window there, right? You should do what's moral first before you do what's practical. Uh, so that's what we mean here by normative dominance. Next is impartiality. Uh, this one should already be part of what you're thinking uh, when you're thinking about morality. Essentially, the slogan for impartiality is just that nobody counts for more than anyone else from the moral perspective, unless there are morally relevant differences between the two. Right, so you uh, are not special in terms of morality. Uh, the value you have as an individual person is the same as the value somebody in another country has as an individual person. Uh, it's not affected by age, height, gender, so on and so forth, right? Uh, every individual counts for the same amount unless there are morally relevant differences between them. So obviously we need to define what counts as a morally relevant difference. Like I said, most things, race, sex, height, hair color, those aren't morally different, right? We shouldn't treat somebody different just because they're 6'1 instead of 5'7 or because they're uh, ginger or red-haired instead of brunette. So what would count as something that is, in fact, re a relevant difference, according to morality, where we could treat two people differently from one another? Uh, some have often thought that rationality is a morally relevant difference. Right? What's important, they claim, what's important about human beings is that they have rationality. And that's what gives us our moral value. Uh, and so some people have argued that's why we don't have to treat certain animals uh, as well as we treat humans or even worry about them at all because animals don't have a high enough level of rationality uh, to count morally. What else could count as a, I mean, that's contentious. Remember that. That's just an example uh, of what some people have said. Another example of what some people have said is a morally relevant difference is the connection we have between friends and family. So there is a morally relevant difference between your parents and a stranger in uh, Alaska. You have a relationship and you've committed time and effort and love, so on and so forth, to your relationships with people. Uh, and so you might owe them more than you owe a stranger because that would count, that relationship would count as a morally relevant difference. Okay. Uh, but generally, unless there's a morally relevant difference, we should treat everybody uh, as equally worthy of value. And then our final principle, um, our final sort of background thought about morality, is that when we're doing moral thinking, we're capturing this notion of reasonableness. In other words, our moral norms are supposed to be reasonable. They're supposed to be the result of critical reflection. They're supposed to be the result of us exercising our rationality. And why is this so important? Well, imagine what morality would be like without reasonableness, right? If the things we believe are morally right and wrong weren't the result of critical reflection, they were just things we happen to believe. Right. So someone comes up and asks, what's your stance on abortion? You say, abortion is morally wrong. And they say, why? What reason do you have for believing that? And you say, well, I don't have any reason. It's just what I, I believe. 
why should anyone care what you're saying then, right? Why should anybody care what your view is if it can't be backed up and has no support? Uh, so that's one of the crucial components about reasonableness is it shows that uh, the moral beliefs we have are actually grounded in something. They're not just free flying, right? It allows us to have arguments and convince one another of our moral positions. Uh, secondly, reasonableness is supposed to help us free moral claims from our bias. Right? Uh, it's supposed to put things in perspective for us. So if we're being reasonable about our moral beliefs, we're reflecting on it, we're thinking about it from a rational perspective, uh, we want to say that the result we reach is something that anybody doing the same type of thinking could also reach. Right? So my result is a universal result. It's not just something that I'm falling into because of my bias, right? So when we're using critical reflection and rationality, we're supposed to be scraping away those biases and uh, thinking about the truth of the claims themselves. Uh, and finally, I mean, from what I've said so far, it sounds like right, we throw emotion out the window and we're just these cold, hard, rational robots thinking about morality and the laws of morality. Uh, but that's not true. Emotion does have a role here in our moral thinking. Uh, the way we feel, the pain and pleasure we get, uh, the strength of our emotional reactions to things get to count as our reasons. It's just knowing that emotion is not the sole uh, arbiter here. Emotion is not the only thing that counts. Uh, what we really need to be doing is taking uh, our evidence, our emotion, our logic, so on and so forth, putting it all together and exercising rationality to come up with what's true about morality given all of these facts. Okay, so that's our introduction here to our moral thinking, some of the key components of what it means to properly think about morality. Remember, we have universality, normative dominance, impartiality, and reasonableness. And in the next video, we will be looking at some actual moral principles uh, that are appealed to often in bioethical reasoning. Uh, thank you.